is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. And since we've no place to go, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Hey there, Internet. You have tuned into Worldview Everlasting, the direct imputation of theological awesomeness that never sleeps. It waits. And it's snowing. Woohoo. But it is Greek Tuesday, and we are back on a roll with the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And we will continue with especially chapter 5 and portions of chapter 6 for the rest of Epiphany. Almost. That means for like the next three weeks, you're going to be getting solid doses of this one boiled down, compounded, solidified passage of Scripture. But we need to be really careful before we even head into this text. If the Beatitudes aren't bad, enough. This text, the entire Sermon on the Mount, is a ginormous stumbling block to those who can't tell the difference between law and gospel. That is, rightly understand that the scripture has two main teachings, what is good and what is evil, and how you are saved by God, by grace alone, through faith as a free gift. And they are not the same, and they do not commingle. And if you commingle them, you lose both of them. The law says, do this, and it's never done. Because no matter how hard you try, how far you go, your own flesh, your own nature prevents you from spiritually keeping the law the way that it should be. That is, desiring to keep it. And more often than not, the law is a curb forcing you to do the right thing rather than simply an expression of your will. You don't do the right thing naturally. The gospel, on the other hand, never says do this. It says believe this. And in that sense, it doesn't even say believe this. It says this is true. And what it says is true is that look, in Christ on the cross, in the forgiveness of sins given through word and sacrament, everything is done already. As the text today will say, the law has reached fulfillment. Now that hardly means the law has gone away. We'll deal with that. But what it means is that the law has come to its ultimate pinnacle, to which it has always intended to point, Christ. He is the word made flesh. All grafted into him, for them, everything is done already. So you never have to do good works? Gosh, see, that question, if you ask that question, that means you don't understand law and gospel. You don't get the gospel, and as a result, all you can think of is the law. And so you have to run back to the law every time somebody says the gospel. You don't have to do that. You want to preach the law? Preach the law. All right, all right. One more piece we got to wrestle with as we head into this. I kind of avoided this last week because it's a little bit of a touchy subject. But in Matthew's gospel, the Sermon on the Mount comes very, very early, directly after two things have happened. Jesus has begun calling his disciples. Specifically, he's called Peter, James, and John. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Which, as we all know, means that you need to go be missionaries. No. (laughs) It means he called three men who are going to be disciples, so named apostles, who are sent ones to fish men with their preaching in the office of the ministry, which looses, binds, baptizes. Yeah. After this, he continues going through Galilee, and great crowds of people are coming to him because he's doing all these gnarly, crazy miracles. You know, healing, casting out demons, sweet action stuff. Well, he sees these crowds, and then he goes up on a mountain. And the crowds come to him? No. The disciples come to him. This is the first use of the word disciples in Matthew. Who is it talking about? Well, if we let Matthew tell us the next time the word is used in a way that would clarify its meaning is in chapter 10, verse 1, when Jesus calls to him his 12 disciples, not 12 of his disciples, his 12 disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. The name of the 12 apostles are these, and then it names them. So not only does he have 12 disciples in Matthew and name them apostles, but he even gives them special superpower gifts that are of apostolic nature. That is, mm, not given to everybody. That's not fair. Well, see, who said life was fair? Gosh, you want mercy, not judgment, right? So, keeping this in mind then, that in Matthew's gospel, the word disciples is not a blanket reference to all Christians, but more so a prototype of the pastoral ministry, those who are sent to loose, bind, baptize, to teach all things. Now this really shouldn't be a problem except that because we're humans, especially because we're late modern American humans, we have this idea that the pastoral office and the average Christian priesthood of the baptized, the believers, that somehow these things are like at odds with each other. And the whole argument tends to be about the will to power, if you're familiar with Nietzsche. The idea that both sides are just really trying to protect themselves from the other side. And so there's, well, there's conflict. This is not the biblical model. This is not what scripture proclaims. Rather, scripture proclaims that the office of the ministry and the people are, in fact, the church together. Christ reigning in our midst through the pastor, not his person, which is sick, weak, all that stuff, but the words he's given to speak. 
These two things go together and it's not about power. <laughs> it's about the word of God. It's about the forgiveness of sins. It's about rightly distinguishing law and gospel for you. So you don't have to do it for yourself. Yeah. So we have this conflict which makes it hard for us to even approach a text like this and start to learn from it that maybe Jesus isn't always speaking to everybody. Strangely enough, when we look at texts that way, sometimes we find there's a whole lot more gospel in them than we thought. All that being said then, I'm going to hang out with Dr. Luther and St. John Chrysostom, especially on today's text, when they teach that coming out of the Beatitudes, the blessings that are what the apostles, disciples, pastors are to preach, this next text about salt and light and warning about whether or not you do teach the law is really primarily directed to the preachers who will come. But here's one more thing you got to understand. There is nothing that is said to preachers which does not by implication apply to the everyday followers of Christ who are the priests of the kingdom to come. So for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when Paul gives these qualifications for an overseer, for a pastor, a bishop, and he lists all these duties that this man in his vocation must fill. It's not like other Christians are off the hook and don't have to aspire to that goodness, because it's the same goodness. It's the same law. Just because Jesus says, hey you pastors, make sure you're teaching everything I command, doesn't mean that the Christian doesn't have to believe everything he commands. See what I'm saying with this? So the whole thing does go together. But the important part is to recognize that Jesus isn't always telling everybody everything in terms of vocation or duty. Yeah. So let's look at the text then and see how this plays out. If we understand then that these blessings are initially given to the apostles as preachers as what they are to preach, right? Not as if it's withheld from everybody else. Then, blessed are those who are preaching when they are persecuted for this preaching, and they should know in such a case that they are the salt of the earth. The word of God goes out and salts the earth. It makes it salty. It purifies, cleanses, and prepares it. But if that salt loses its taste, then the earth cannot be salted. That when one is to preach and or confess the word of God, this is the thing which makes the earth saved. Nothing outside of this makes this world worth anything at all. In fact, it is only good to be thrown into the fire. And so, if the Christian's confession loses its saltiness, or if the predictom to the preacher's preaching loses its truth, its veracity in being the pure word of God, guess what? It's useless. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So blessed are you when you are persecuted for the righteousness of faith preached in Christ crucified alone. And when it is preached and confessed, this is the salvation of the world. But if that word is silenced, if for fear or greed, the tongue stops speaking pure truth, all things given by Christ's mouth, and there remains no hope, none, only death in the grave. This is why you are the light of the world. You are the thing which lightens the world. Firstly, the predictum, the preaching office, which was sent to preach and baptize. But in so doing, to call out of darkness into the wonderful light of Christ, all Christians whose own joy is to confess everything that he has done. This word, preached and confessed, lightens the world, brings illumination to the valley of the shadow of death. It cannot be hidden any more than a city built on a hill. That is, if you are a believer, and especially if you are a preacher, you cannot help but speak this word. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. And thus there is some exhortation here that what you should not do is hide your doctrine. <laughs> the last thing any sane person would ever do is hide the pure word of God, the fullness of the confession, even though that light might hurt the eyes of a few people who don't like light. But there is no way for any to see the light and come to it if we hide it. If we say our people aren't ready for pure doctrine, we need to go out and get them together with something else and kind of make them soft and and then give them meat. Um, it'll never happen, people. Promise you that. I mean, you might get a lot of people together. Pharisees had a lot of people together. So in the same way, let your light shine before others so they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Good works? Huh? What are the commandments? First, um, have the true God. Second, um, speak his name rightly. Third, um, receive his good gifts. Those are the chief, ultimate good works from which all the others will flow. There's no greater work than to profess the Christ, to apologize in the classic sense for his doctrine, to explain how he died, rose again for the world. And when people see this, when they hear this, and they find that you in fact believe it and it does matriculate through every aspect of your world that you in fact have authentic faith this is what will bring them to believe when you can actually say yeah I'm a sinner and that's wrong and I don't want to do it I'm sorry I did nothing will do more for mission than that but now the warning the warning to the preachers who think that somehow who Jesus is and what he has done has changed the law itself has in some way made right and wrong no longer right and wrong but has shifted the cosmology of the world I'm not going to name names 
just going to put up some pictures. But really, I mean, this goes a lot further. This goes to anybody who would lessen the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Nothing has changed in regards to the law. Good is still good. Evil is still evil. Murder is wrong. Adultery is wrong. Lying is wrong. Stealing is wrong. Why? Because it hurts other people people. People are still people and need to be loved, and love is not a matter of what I feel, what I want, or giving others everything they desire, but a matter of the order of the cosmos which was established for harmony and goodness. Pursuing that. For truly I say to you, Jesus says, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. There's your Greek for Greek Tuesday. Iota! It means iota. It's the I, small little letter, smallest letter in the alphabet. Not even an iota will pass away from the law. Is Jesus just talking about the Torah and Leviticus? Well, yes, in a sense he is, although he's going to give a hint as to when this actually cosmologically ends. But no, he's talking about the revelation of the will of God in goodness, what is true, what is false. There's a big difference between the compact that was made between God and the nation state of Israel and what God created the world to be. God did not create the world to be so that you could only wear one kind of thread in your clothing. He did that in the compact with Israel. God did not create the world to be that all men would be circumcised. He did create that compact with Israel. But see, God did create the Ten Commandments built into the fabric of the world. They will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away before these things pass away, meaning they're not ever going to. Only the Decalogue is eternal. Therefore, verse 19, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So you cannot take any piece of the Decalogue and relax it. You can't loosen it, even just a little bit. And this is a great jeopardy and danger for teachers and preachers who, by so loosening the law, are likely to make friends and influence people by being nice rather than honest. And so this is a real warning. It's not a warning, interestingly enough, that you will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but simply that in the kingdom you'll be the guy who gets to clean the toilets. Because you got your glory now by selling out. <laughs> but conversely, whoever does and teaches the commandments will be called great in the reign of heaven. Why? And here's the key coming up on verse 20. Why will the one who teaches and does the commandments be great in the kingdom of heaven? Is it because he's justified by his works? Absolutely not. It's because, wait, oh, wait, what's salvation through? Faith is because he believes the word. And that's what's great, to believe the word. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Your righteousness. What righteousness? The righteousness that comes not through works like the Pharisees who kept the externals of the law but could not keep it in their hearts because they didn't believe that word. That righteousness is not enough. Our nature clings to it and dirties it, desanctifies it, makes it unholy. But the righteousness of faith alone exceeds the righteousness of works and is the only way to enter the reign of God. Such a righteousness, which is through faith alone, does not come to the law and say, Oh, look, the law which is the word of God, I don't believe it. Nope, it's not true. Quite the opposite. This is faith. Faith believes the word. And so, while the gospel is appropriated through faith alone for salvation, faith plays a role with the law as well, primarily that we believe it is true and thus do pursue it. This just isn't for salvation. And so we're back to that law gospel thing and understanding which thing does what. The law, in fact, tells you what's good and what's evil the way you should go. The gospel tells you <laughs> what God is doing for you, namely, saving you in Jesus' name. But the long and short is that Jesus is giving words to his disciples to preach. These words, as Jesus preaches them to the twelve, are overflowing to the crowds. And so all are hearing the blessings which he is giving and the warnings that his word is true and to be believed. Everything that he will teach. This will include both the Decalogue, which is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament text, and the fulfillment of that Decalogue in the end of time come early in Christ on the cross, which will flow out in proclamation, baptism, forgiveness of sins to create create faith in both law and gospel. Lives lived not to justify themselves, but to serve the neighbor for the good because we are justified by what he's done. <sighs> yeah. Hope that helps a little bit. Like I said, the Sermon on the Mount is about as tough a text as you're going to get because, well, the law that is there, it's straight up 200 proof law. I mean, it doesn't hold back at all. But the gospel is there. As long as you don't commingle it with the law, it's straight up gospel. I mean, blessed are you from Jesus' mouth. Pretty good stuff. Don't confuse them. They're both true. Rock on.